Have you ever felt that there were multiple facets of your personality and yourself that had competing agendas? Well, you might not be wrong. Hi, I'm Caitlin Thompson. I'm a independent researcher, microbiome expert, and probiotic manufacturer. And this is the psychedelic microbiome. Uh, okay. Oops, sorry. So how did I get here to where I am studying the effects of psychedelics and the microbiome? Well, it started with my personal story. And when I was in college, I was doing a lot of exploration with psychedelic substances. I was going to Burning Man uh, festivals and going to Peru and drinking ayahuasca. And what I didn't realize was that actually my entire life, I had been suffering from a chronic illness that encompassed a whole bunch of different things, such as depression, fatigue, Lyme disease. I was immunocompromised. I had skin issues. I had a lot of pain, anxiety, food allergies, and PTSD. But when I was actively using psychedelics, I wasn't as affected by these symptoms. And it wasn't until I sort of buckled down on school in the last semester of my undergraduate neurobiology degree that I started to take a step back from psychedelics and focus more on school. And what happened was I noticed around the seventh to eighth week mark after my last psychedelic experience, like clockwork, I would start to feel like I was chemically unraveling. I would start to experience severe fatigue and anxiety and just felt emotionally agitated for no real reason. And I finally connected this to the time away from my last psychedelic experience. So what I realized was that I had had this chronic illness my whole life without even really knowing it and had been effectively mitigating it with psychedelic drugs. So once I discovered this, I just fell down the rabbit hole and became obsessed with understanding what was going on with myself, which led me to studying the microbiome. So it turns out that you're actually less human than you thought you were. So bacteria in our bodies outnumber us 10 to 1. There are 100 trillion cells of bacteria inside of you, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. There's 150 times the genetic material of bacteria inside of you than there is human DNA. But gut bacteria are super fundamental for actually mediating a lot of our physical processes and dictating the state of our health. For example, they play a huge role in modulating our immune system, in our inflammatory pathways, in the way that we metabolize nutrients and food, how we digest and extract food, our stress response, and even our brain function and mood. So this population of bacteria that live in our guts, they're just like any sort of community. They have all sorts of different personalities. They like different things. They have different strengths and weaknesses, and they're good at doing different things. And just like any community, you need these different roles in order to create harmony and have it be self-sustaining. You need the farmers. You need the teachers. You need the plumbers. You need the technicians. You need the pizza delivery boy. And just like any community, when one of these participants is either too dominating or is not participating enough, the harmonious nature of the community falls apart. And when you see bacteria in the gut start to overgrow or to get crowded out and die, you lose diversity and you actually develop an imbalance of bacteria called gut dysbiosis. Now gut dysbiosis is associated with many different diseases, including autoimmune conditions, diabetes, depression, neurodegenerative diseases, skin conditions, schizophrenia, and even certain cancers. So the study of the microbiome is absolutely changing the field of psychiatry for the better. And what we've realized is that our gut 
is actually kind of like a whole other brain for us. And there is this thing called the enteric nervous system, which basically describes how embedded and integrated our nervous system is within our gut lining. There's actually more neurons in your spinal cord than there, uh, sorry, there's more neurons in your gut than there are in your spinal cord, which gives you an idea of the density of nervous system tissue that you have in your intestines. So in 1937, there was a molecule discovered in the guts of rabbits called enteramine. Now, about 10 years later, the same molecule was discovered, except they gave it a different name and it was called serotonin and they found it in our brains. So from there, we started to describe serotonin as this neurotransmitter and thought about it being specific to the nervous system. But actually 90% of serotonin activity is in our guts and about 60% of our serotonin supply isn't even made by our bodies. It's made by our gut bacteria. So what's fascinating about this is if you take an organism such as a rat and you somehow create an environment where it develops a disease, you can take that rat's microbiome and transplant it to a healthy rat. And the outcome is that the healthy rat will develop a disease. This has been explored with diabetes, with obesity, with colitis, and with depression. And what's also fascinating is if you take the healthy rat's microbiome and transplant it into a diseased rat, oftentimes the disease state will actually be reversed in the diseased rat that receives the healthy rat transplant. So there's something really interesting going on here and it's created a lot of interest around looking at fecal matter transplants as an intervention in medicine. So psychedelics are kind of like that nerdy kid that you thought was kind of weird in high school, but then they come to the 10 year high school reunion and they're actually super hot and successful. Psychedelics are making a huge comeback in research in medicine and spiritual practices. And they are specifically showing a lot of uh, progress in helping us develop psychedelic assisted psychotherapies, especially for PTSD, for depression, for obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders and anxiety. But there's also some evidence that psychedelics might be useful for uh, different physical conditions such as pain, autoimmune conditions, and even cognitive decline. And then of course, we're finding ways of applying psychedelics to enhance spiritual practices, emotional healing, and even performance enhancement, especially in the microdosing communities. So, most psychedelics share the feature that they interact with the serotonin system in humans, specifically the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor is a site that they all sort of characteristically bind to. Now, what's interesting is you might see here on the top left, this is serotonin. This is the molecule that our bodies make as a neurotransmitter. It's structurally very similar to a lot of these psychedelic compounds. And because of this, these psychedelic compounds can actually fit into serotonin receptors and mimic serotonin activity affecting our consciousness. Okay, so what is this lady going on and on about? She totally jumped from talking about one thing to another. How are these two fields even connected? Well, the thing that connects bacteria and psychedelics is that they both affect our state of consciousness by interacting with our endogenous neurotransmitter systems, in particular serotonin. So how do these things synergize with each other? All right, what happens when you expose bacteria to psychedelic drugs? So we don't know exactly why bacteria are producing serotonin, but it's likely that they're using it as some sort of signaling molecule between each other. And some research suggests that if you treat bacteria with serotonin directly, 
it can increase the abundance of certain types of gut bacteria, which implies that there's some sort of role in the serotonin for being important for bacterial survival. Now, a lot of these gut bacteria also have these homologous proteins that are very similar to the serotonin transporter protein that you see in humans. Now, these serotonin transporter proteins are responsible for bringing serotonin into a cell. So there's a lot of evidence that these proteins and bacteria can also transport serotonin into the bacteria cell. So my question is, if bacteria are able to transport serotonin inside of them, could they also potentially be transporting serotonin analogs such as these psychedelic compounds into their cell too? And if so, what's happening there? So there's also likely some indirect effects of psychedelics on our gut bacteria. Now, there's this really important nerve called the vagus nerve. Not the fear and loathing in Las Vegas nerve, but the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is a thick bundle of nerves that goes from the brain and down into our internal organs, specifically the gut. And this nerve is responsible for being a two directional street that can bring information from the brain down to the gut and information from the gut up to the brain. So it's a bi-directional axis. For example, your brain function and stress response change your gut environment and actually dictate what type of organisms can live there. They can do this through uh, affecting the mucus barrier of your gut, affecting the secretion of gastric juices, which will affect the pH, and ultimately influence what type of bacteria can grow and thrive there. Now, in turn, changes in the microbiome can also change our brain function or even our mood. For example, our microbiome is, is making neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine, regulating inflammation, which is definitely important for our brain health, and extracting nutrients help us maintain proper brain function. So it's a two-way street here. It's particularly interesting to look at how this two-way street between the, the gut and the brain are affected by trauma and stress. So there's this thing called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs that are used to study the amount of traumatic, stressful experiences that someone has in their childhood. And what many studies have shown is that these ACEs are linked to microbiome related diseases and the risk of developing things like autoimmune conditions, cancer, or even chronic illnesses. And the truth is that there are downstream effects on the microbiome mediated through this vagus nerve when somebody is exposed to stress or trauma. If you think about when you're having a stress response and you're trying to run from a lion and escape it, your body's gonna shut down all of your digestion. It's gonna shut down your immune system because those things aren't important for the immediate survival of an organism. So if you're having a chronic stressful experience, your body is going to shut down these non-essential processes, which are going to affect what type of organisms are inhabiting your gut. So psychedelics show promise in actually helping us resolve trauma and normalize our stress response through the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and correct dysfunction, ultimately changing our gut environment and changing who lives there. So what I wonder is, can psychedelics help us resolve the emotional pain and trauma in a way that actually physically changes our microbiome? So what if psychedelics are directly and indirectly changing our microbiomes? What does that mean for the development of medicine? What does that mean for the development of psychotherapy? And what does that mean for changing the paradigm that we actually think about healing ourselves. And these questions started to really invite a bigger question of who am I? If the state of our microbiomes can dramatically affect our mood, our personality, and even the story that we tell around the things that happen in our lives, then who are we really? 
if a dynamic conglomerate of organisms can craft such fundamental aspects of who we are, then who are we? Are we a single entity with an egoic identity or is there consciousness and sense of self actually a result of a Gaian type of collective consciousness facilitated by a we? Perhaps the me is more of a we. And are we as human beings also part of a collective network of organisms creating an emergent consciousness? What can we learn from understanding ourselves and nature through this different paradigm? How can we take this idea and use it to harmonize better with ourselves, each other, and our planet? So I'll finish off with a little personal story. So once upon a time in a jungle far, far away in Ecuador, I was in an ayahuasca ceremony and I was at the height of my autoimmune condition. And I decided to make contact with my microbiome. And I asked them, microbes, <laughs> please, please, can you find peace with each other? Can you restore harmony by getting along and not taking more than you need? And by understanding that you are a community and I am a part of you and asking them to preserve my body so that I could continue to be a vessel for their existence. And I sent this with love and with sincere asking. And I felt, after asking, I felt a clear sense of being received, of being heard, of being acknowledged. And a sense of peace came over me as I felt that finally, all versions of me had agreed to be fully integrated. Thank you so much for your time.